facilitating a little bit uh, better the Albats project. I will come also to the methodology because I think it's important to, for you to understand how we are trying to engage also some stakeholders. We are not different stakeholders outside of the partnership. Um, and we are, um, and I'm trying to show you how we are also doing that. Then I will bring some results that we already achieved uh, for the intelligence, so the analysis that we are doing for the sector, uh, and some results also about the education and training. So this is uh, the step that I would say that is more, uh, um, that is more late to uh, coming in late into the project, but I will come up with some information as well. So starting with Albats. Albats is, as I told you, an Erasmus Plus project. It's a sector skills alliance program, as, uh, as a matter of fact. It's a project uh, with a budget of around 4 million euros, um, and it intends to contribute to bringing uh, more skilled people and uh, improving the skills within the battery sector. We are um, covering all the entire whole value chain uh, of batteries, including uh, mobile and stationary applications. Um, and of course, we are. Uh, this is an European project. Of course, we are using the European, exi or the already existing European policies, instruments, bringing this together uh, with stakeholders, uh, trying to identify and harmonize and standardize some job roles and the skills that are necessary for for the, the battery sector. We will also develop some training uh, courses. This is not the main aim of our project, but we will also do that. Uh, that will be, at the end, available, of course, for the industry and for um, uh, training providers as well. So this is basically what, what ABATS is. We are 20 partners from 11 countries, uh, coordinated by Sheleftio Municipality. I hope I'm, this is a good pronunciation. We have two representatives from Sheleftio here. Uh, and we join here people from industry, people from uh, industry representatives, also higher education, vocational education and training, and also some research and development um, entities. We also have, uh, or are creating a big network, I would say, because uh, we want to work with other initiatives at the European level. It doesn't make sense to be alone, uh, so we are an uh, ecosystem that are working uh, for the same purposes. So, of course, for, since the beginning we have a steering board which acts like a consultancy for, for the project management, but we have also some contacts already with EBA Academy, uh, with Automotive Skills Alliance, with uh, Battery 2030, and also at the national level. And here Finland, I think it's a good example because we are uh, very active in Finland, uh, working with the ministries already, with industry, with uh, also uh, other education providers. Albats is tackling two main, main questions. So what we are trying to, to answer is what is going on on the battery sector at a, an European level um, and in the first hand, I would say, but uh, also trying to go at the national level as uh, if possible. And uh, how this, the, everything that is going on is affecting the role, job roles and the skills that are needed for the sector. This is what we call the sectoral intelligence. We have some work packages working on this specific uh, topic or question. The other one is how we can address uh, the current challenges and how can we um, deliver trainings uh, that are as uh, efficient, uh, sufficient, sufficiently and fast enough to, to, to fill in the gaps that exist uh, already for, for the battery industry. So bringing the methodology, how we are trying to tackle these two questions. So first, picking up the sectoral intelligence, we are uh, working, we, we started, I would say, with a huge desk research, and I have here a, <laughs> a colleague that works a lot on, on, this, on this part of the sectoral intelligence. So desk research, but also engaging stakeholders by participating in workshops, um, by making some interviews to experts, uh, we also uh, had some surveys, and with all this information, we, have, we are uh, delivering some reports about what are the jobs uh, needed, what are the new skills that uh, are arising for the sector, uh, and also some insights for the education and training framework uh, already. So this is the inputs that we will have for the work to be done in the education and training um, work package. I have here just three examples of the reports from the intelligence uh, work that is being done. 
If you go to our website, you can find out much more of uh, these reports, but this is uh, quite interesting information, I believe. Um, sometimes you can uh, think that the reports are too big, but the information is there for sure. <laughs> we are trying also to improve a little bit how the, the, the information is uh, um, delivered to, 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 to the stakeholders. The connection between sectoral intelligence and education as of course is a, of course we are picking up the information from the sectoral intelligence we are deeply analyzing these job roles the skills that are identified uh, that are being needed and we are transferring this into the education and training vocabulary I would say um, something like this so we are trying we are writing learning objectives for education and, and uh, vocational mostly for vocational education and training. We will pilot some of the courses that we are developing. We have not yet started with that, but we will try to use. Also some innovative methodologies of training because uh, also training and education is evolving a lot, not only the industry, so we have to adapt, we have to digitalize more, we have to see how uh, the youngsters and the adults behave uh, uh, in the learning process, and we have to set and test different ways of uh, delivering the training. And we cannot forget the trainers and the teachers, because this is a, a new sector. If we, we can develop lots of things, but if we don't have trainers and teachers that are competent uh, enough to deliver the training, this won't be possible uh, to have uh, efficient training on the, for the sector. And of course, at the end, as I told you, we are making first uh, an analysis of, at the European level, but we are trying also to bring also the national levels, the governments, the ministries, the education agencies um, to, the, to the project uh, so we can profit uh, much more, uh, so they can profit much more with, with the project results. So, Going to the results, I, I, br I brought here about the sectoral intelligence two, two examples of uh, the data that we are collecting and the information that we are delivering to, to, the, to the industry and to the other stakeholders as well. Uh, so we are, as I told you, we are uh, going into the entire life cycle of the, the batteries, uh, analyzing the skills, the job roles that are needed. Uh, we will also deliver uh, a sectoral skills uh, strategy uh, in order to become to have so this project can have some sustainability at the end because we don't want this to be just a four year project we want this the, the results to sustain and to be able to 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 succeed in the future as well and be uh, of course a tool uh, for for the industry so the first the first example that i i, I brought uh, is about raw materials and processing I think, I believe this is something that it's uh, interesting for, for Finland at least. <laughs> it's a subject that is interesting. So what we did, we identified, of course, the, 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 the critical materials. I have to say this, this new geopolitical situation might change a little bit. This scenario uh, will perhaps uh, follow up this, uh, with new reports or new information about all the new situation. But nevertheless, we have... Uh, after the, 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 the analysis that we done to the market, we have some, some of the suggestions for, for the sector, for the education and also for industry. And one thing that we think that is really important is to, that everybody should be really aware of the situation of these critical materials, which are the critical materials for the value chain. Because in Europe we want to have a complete value chain. Uh, we, can, we want to be uh, independent, I would say, from other uh, countries and other parts of the world. Um, that's one, one part that is uh, already identified as really important is the mining and refining and uh, how can we deliver skills into this, this part of the process. And of course, one thing that we, we, we are a cooperation, we are a partnership of companies, entities from different parts of Europe. We have to cooperate. We have cooperation, cooperation, we have cooperation. If we want this to be a uh, well succeed European um, case study, the European uh, industry, so we have to cooperate. And we have already some, some good examples and tools in the European Commission, from the European Commission, which is, uh, for instance, the skills agenda that can um, give the, the, the baseline for, for cooperation and to, uh, to, because it brings together many stakeholders from, from uh, all parts of Europe. 
Uh, we have also identified some uh, expertise domains that are important. I, I see that I have <laughs> really uh, just a few minutes more, so I will pass this part a little bit faster. Um, we, this, this is how we are also presenting the, the information from, from the sectoral intelligence uh, about skills needs as well. We identified which are the skills uh, that are important. Uh, I have brought here also about cell components manufacturing, about production, the production maintenance. I'm sorry, but I will pass this part because I will <laughs> I want to, to go to the other part. So, and then that, that's just two examples of uh, the output that we are giving for, 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 for the community, I would say. About education and training, as I said, this is starting, uh, I, I, I think, for the next years, two years, this will be the, the hardest work of, of the project. Um, we already um, defined a kind of a framework for the education training uh, within the battery sector, which is based in four pillars. What we think, and I will put here the information already, uh, what we think is that we should uh, concentrate in, in the entire uh, levels of qualification, not only in uh, one or two, but the entire role of from three to eight. We need to be really uh, on the training, so the trainings that we develop for the industry should be really flexible and easily adapted, because the industry is uh, adapt, uh, evolving so fast that we, the training and education system should also be fast. Uh, we should focus on innovative and flexible training. We have people coming from all over the world, uh, lots of immigrants, so this should be also very inclusive. Um, this should be also ICT based, using what is already developed uh, by the market and there's lots of information already the, um, available. Don't forget the trainers and the trainees and also people and tutors from companies because lots of learning is, do, is done inside of companies. And I would say this is the most difficult one. The, f the final pillar is to guarantee how we can have a recognition wide in, for the entire uh, countries in Europe because each country has its own education and training system. So this is really complex situation, but we are also trying to tackle this by um, using those, those topics there. And I think I'm done. <laughs> okay, I have two eyes over there looking at me. So if you need any information, additional information from Alberts, you can see us on the website, uh, on the social media, and of course contact me or contact Alberts. And Thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry if I was too late. No problem. Thank you, Hoa. Thank you, Lars. Uh, like the session before today, uh, after the presentations, we will have a panel discussion. Then we will have time for, for questions and discussion with, uh, uh, with all people uh, talking today. But we will continue now. We will have here Peter Karsten from Schellefteo, and he will tell what does it mean in practice when you are building a, a gigafactory in, uh, in your town? And uh, I think it is a project is demanding for the big company, but is very demanding for the municipal as well. Welcome, Peter Karsten. Okay. Um, well, that's an old picture. No. Anyway, uh, good to be here. Thanks for the invite to come to Vasa. I spent a few days here now with, with uh, Vasek and some other people, seeing the academic side, seeing some of the companies, and I'm really impressed. And I'm also here, of course, to spy a little bit to see if we can find some nice collaborations. Not to steal anyone, but to collaborate. That's important to understand. And I see a lot of things that we can collaborate around. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the tactical part. We, we know a lot about the strategic parts. We heard a lot of speakers talking about the strategic divisions about batteries, Europe, the world, electrification. I will talk a little bit more about the tactical part because we are in the middle of executing a battery factory in Schlefto. And the fact is that Schlefto is, is really uh, has a nice tradition of industrial companies supplying the world. We have a lot of international companies supplying to other big companies around the world, and that's really something we're quite proud of. But we've been struggling with people because young kids move when they quit school. We don't have any uh, 
universities, for example. So they leave. So 2014, the municipality said, stop, we need to find a solution for this. So we started to work with our branding of Schlefto as a place to move and live in. And we did it, and uh, we set the quite high goal. We said that 2030, we're going to be 80,000 people in Schlefto. At that time, we were at 73,000. And everybody was shaking their heads, because sometimes in my region, they can say, well, that's not possible. So that was what happened. So we start working with the establishment, trying to attract companies to our region. And 2017, Peter Karlsson said, this is the place we're going to establish, Northwold, the battery factory. And we're going to hire 2,500 employees. So you better do two things now. You need to get the people here to work, and you also need to build housing so they have somewhere to live. And what happens in the municipality when a huge gigafactory decides to place themselves in a small town like Schlefto, with, you know, at currently, we have 74,000 people. Well, we sat down and said, what will be the consequence? Ramble helped us with the scenario analyze, and the fact is that we are not going to be 80,000, we're going to be 90,000 in 2030 and 100,000 in 2040. And combine that with the fact that we have Sweden's lowest unemployment rate of 4.2%. And we have companies at the moment with huge growth that needs people. They need people to work. So this has happened. So the fact is that we're going to have more than 50,000 people working in and around Schlefto in 2030. That means 16,000 people more than today. It's a complete Kiruna, if you know what that is. That's LKAB's factory, uh, mining up in the north part of Sweden. That's quite a, a lot of people. And the good thing here is that if you look at the population structure in, in my hometown, we have a lot of kids and we have a lot of old people. And the people between 20 to, let's say, 56 years is less. And they are usually the people working, bringing the tax into the municipality. But what we see now is that there's a lot of people moving into Schlefto. Families, uh, working people from all across the world. And we see that the tax income is going to increase. So we're going to get a little more on the hips, you know, to be a little bit more structured. And that is good. I'm not supposed to say this, but maybe that means that we can also cut some of the tax rates. <laughs> that will also attract people to our municipality. Well, this is some of the comp uh, things. Uh, it will also mean, I mean, Northwold, <laughs> actually, I met the CEO here uh, last Monday, and he said, Peter, we are not going to be 2,500 people. We're going to be 4,500 people. So you need to go back and think how many more houses you will build for my staff. And that means that we're going to have 7,000 people working in the industrial part of Schlefto. We will have service companies around 4,300, restaurants and, and service around the, the, the area, and also the municipality will also need to hire a lot of people. And this is quite a challenge, I would say, to do this. Uh, so, this is also the challenge in infrastructure. We're going to have 4,000 more kids who need a place in school. And you can imagine uh, a kindergarten, 30 kids. How many more kindergartens do we need to build? So the focus is quite high on infrastructure today. Uh, I've been working in Dubai for many years, and uh, I always talked about the building cranes when I got home to Schlefto. Now they are outside my window. Many. I took a picture, and I had a lot of building cranes. And that's kind of the... I, I like it, but not everybody's liking it. Good. So what are we actually talking about? A lot of people want to talk about Northwold. But for us, who lives in Schlefto and breathe Schlefto every day, we want to talk about the new industrial growth place. And we learned, because I work a lot with the ecosystem of companies in Schlefto, and they came to me and they said, hey, we don't really feel included in everything, because everybody's talking about establishments, establishments bringing in new actors into Schlefto, and that's good. But we don't forget that we really have a strong ecosystem of companies in Schlefto in a quite high growth. Everybody is growing out of their current facilities, building new ones. They need also people, and they need also service from the municipality. So we did a small map about this. When we talk about the new industrial workplace, we talk about Boliden. 
a really nice company that's been building and being a quite good municipality builder and building the environment in, in, in Schlefte for a long time. We have Northvolt now. We talk a lot about we want them to be, become the community builders and involve yourself in the community. We have uh, Ranscher, that's part of Boliden, of course. We have LKAB, that's actually at the moment looking at Schlefto as a site for the new uh, recycling facility. And that's a huge investment. And also we have the gaming industry. If you're looking at the industry today, you can see cross functions going all across. We see gaming with, with mining companies. Everything is about to just uh, develop new ways of working, new methods, make it more efficiency in, in every business that, that's, that there are. Also, we have a lot of community builders. We have Schlefte Kraft. We own that company, and that's good. One of the largest in Sweden. They are very deeply involved in everything that's happening at the moment. We got all the, the others. We have also all the construction companies. And we also have the subcontractors working with everybody. We have the service company. And if you look on the side there, all these companies have a huge growth at the moment. And when I show this to all, all my companies that, that we meet usually, they, ah, yeah, you're right. Because some of the companies here, they say, well, we are actually not selling to Northvolt. No, but who's your customer? Well, I'm selling to, to Caveiron, who's selling to Skanska, who's selling to... So everything is in one ecosystem. So from the municipality side, and our daily work is working to create a good ecosystem, to support everything. Northvolt said on Monday, I mean, we have to remember that Northvolt is the world's biggest startup. That's quite crazy. So one of the guys, he said, told me, hey, Peter, do you know anyone who can wash 4,000 work robes every week? I'm, I'm not sure. Business opportunity. Look for someone that can do that. So we're helping out with, with that kind of building of the infrastructure. So for the city, what does it mean? Well, ah, good, I have five minutes. I don't need to speak as fast as I did. Huh? Thank you. No, there's a lot of values that are easy to forget in, when we're talking about building a community. Uh, we have more than 100 different cultures and nationalities in Schlefto. And they all have difficulties uh, pronouncing Schlefto. So I say, well, she left you. Can you say that? Yeah, she left you. Yeah, now you got it. But we don't want anyone to leave us. But, yeah, but we can see an increase of housing markets. Uh, I mean, the value of the town is increasing a lot with the value of yeah. housing. Uh, people who want to buy are, are less uh, impressed, but uh, the ones who are selling, it's, it's good. We also see the banks are opening up for increased financing, and that's important. We see uh, the municipality as a flower. We have a huge municipality. All the villages surrounding, uh, who uh, currently or, or before had issues to get a loan from the bank, now the banks are willing to take risks because you know, the core is growing quite fast. Uh, we see sports clubs uh, uh, in general growing, get a lot of requests of new members. And in Sweden, uh, the more members you have, the more money you get from the government to support your, your sport. We see the attractive tourist and visit industry is growing really fast. We see the shopping and restaurants. Uh, I think I have 10 or 15 new food chains wants to come to Schlefto. So it's really nice. And I mean, in the past, when we only have kebab bars, uh, sausage and everything, now we can sit on a Saturday and decide that, well, what are we going to eat tonight? And the interesting thing is that I got a call from an angry citizen. He said, well, it's becoming really crazy. We had to book a table to go to a restaurant. I, I never booked a table before in my life. And I like it because this is good. That means that we have a flourishing city. And also attracting talent, of course, money. Investments are attracting talent. We get people from all over the world. And the good thing is we also get a lot of people that move from Schlefto back to Schlefto. I mean, the grandfathers like it. Now they get to take care of their grandchildren and so on. So they, they are quite happy. But, you know, uh, not everything is gold. There is some uh, challenges, of course. And uh, we try to be as honest as we can about the challenges. 
Some people want to sweep it under the carpet, but we cannot do that. But in fact, internal processing can take much longer time. In uh, 2011, we had one request for a new building of a house, a villa in Schlefto. 2020, we had 1,200 building permits requests. So you can understand, it's a quite big difference. Lack of land, Schlefto is a huge municipality, but we are starting to to not have uh, enough land to, to, provide, to provide to people. So that's uh, quite a big thing. The supply of energy, that's been a topic. In Sweden now, energy is gold. People are looking for gold. I mean, uh, Northvolt established himself in Schlefto because of our energy uh, supply. That's good. Uh, access to labor, as I said, we have the lowest uh, uh, numbers in Sweden in terms of unemployment and so on. So this is also increased crime rates. We can see that when people come, we have 2,500 guest workers. I mean, we can see a lot of things happening at the moment, but we try to keep track on it. But the two big issues here, as I said in the beginning, housing. We are building around 1,000 new apartments every year now for the coming eight years. And will it be enough? We'll see. We also need to start building villas because people don't want to live in apartments all their life. They want to live in the villas in the areas. So that's the one thing. And the other one is competence. We need more competence. We need people who want to come there and build the Schlefto and the region together with us. If we competed in the past, we never do that anymore. Now we need to collaborate. We need to do it together. And we need to do it together with Vasa. We need to do it together with Norway. We need to do it together with all our neighbors in the, in the north part of Sweden. And all the uh, foreign people who want to come there and work, remember she left you? That's the name you're going to tell everybody in the future. So the question is, uh, are we prepared to do what it takes? This is the, from our hockey team. We, you know, we are prepared to do what it takes. And yes, we are. At least you need to, if you're not the king, you need to at least pretend you are to make sure that things are happening. Was that good in time? Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, thank you. And again, questions during the panel discussion. But OK, we will continue and uh, move uh, westwards and see what's happening uh, westwards and see what's happening in Norway. And uh, we will have Mr. Peter Arnesen with us today from Norsk Industry, and he will tell about establishing a national team in battery skills, the Norwegian approach. And Fisherman Ahoy, he's very talented in aquaculture as well. <laughs> Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Th thank you, Lasse, and uh, I must say it's, uh, it's great to be back in, in Vasa. I haven't been here in 35 years. Uh, I was here for an orienteering event, and I must, find, I must say I find there's a lot more energy in Vasa now than 35 years ago. With regards to my background in aquaculture, there are so many similarities to aquaculture with the battery industry that's being built. Uh, skills is one. Uh, everything that has to do with uh, traceability and sustainability is another one. We have been working in aquaculture for, I mean, a long, long time with those topics. So there's a lot for the battery industry to learn. And I must say I'm really impressed about what you're doing in Schleftio. Uh, okay, I won't uh, spend more time on that. So just hopefully this works. Yeah, there's no sound. But anyway... Okay, so the BATCOMP project, what have we done? Well, Norsk Industry, or the, Norwegian, no, the Federation of Norwegian Industries, is the biggest uh, industry association in Norway. So all these new uh, battery factories that are now emerging, they are basically all of them are members in our association. So what they said is that we have to get a lot of people into this industry in a very, very short time. So they asked us, can you try to find out how we can do that? 
So what we did, I mean, we did a it's very, very, very simple approach. We asked the industry, okay, what do you need? Where do you need the competence? Which skills do you need? Then we asked the educators, what can you actually offer today? What courses are you actually teaching? And then we looked at, we identified the gaps. Uh, the uh, inputs from the projects that we've been done will be uh, used by uh, the Norwegian government now for their first battery uh, report, which, uh, or the strategy, strategy report, which will come out now in April. Just very briefly, Norway has uh, the, more or less the whole value chain uh, when it comes to uh, battery production. So, we, of course, we have the, 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 the cell manufacturers that are emerging now, and we heard Freyr earlier today. We have the recirculation, we have raw materials, we have applications. So, basically, we have more or less uh, the whole value chain. So, we need to have people to work in many, many areas in this industry. If you look at, uh, I mean, it's very difficult at this time to say how many people are actually going to be employed in this industry. Uh, so uh, currently we're looking at, you know, s around 7,000 jobs uh, in the cell uh, production industry alone in the next few years, but maybe up to 30,000 jobs in the whole value chain in maybe the next 10 years. So it's a lot of people. And, as has been said here for, I think, both Sweden and Finland, we don't have a lot of people actually available, because most of the people in Norway do have jobs. Uh, potentially, this industry is going to have a, an export-based turnover of around 90 billion NOC in 2030. That's about 9 billion euros growing maybe to the double in 2050. And as you mentioned, mentioned fish, Norway is the second biggest in, in, in value exporter of fish in the world behind China. And we export fish for around 110, bil 110 billion NOC. So this industry is going to be almost as big in a very, very short time. But as we say here, we need to educate a lot of people in a short time. Short term, we are now covering uh, these requirements by importing people, especially from Asia. We've had some issues related to, to our uh, immigration regulations, so th those need to be smoothened out. Medium term, we need to reskill and upskill existing workforces with transferable competencies. And there are quite a few industries that have transferable competencies. And then, of course, in the long term, we need to educate young people. We need to have newly skilled workers through education and training. Also, I must say, uh, the industry is, has been uh, very, very uh, uh, concerned about you know, ev everyone pulling together. So, they really actively want to contribute to building a national team for battery education. Vocational training and lifelong education. I mean, that's what it's all about these days, lifelong education. You're supposed to be learning you know, throughout your whole uh, working career. So we need to establish uh, efficient collaboration models uh, in the education sector so that a national battery education program can be developed. And, and that's, we see that happening now. So schools, I mean, uh, vocational schools and universities, they need to collaborate in offering battery education in several geographical locations. Uh, they should be module-based and taught digitally. And of course, the pandemic has shown us how easy it is now to actually do teaching online. Uh, obviously, it's beneficial to meet in person from time to time, but you can sit almost anywhere now and be, you know, take participating in uh, digital courses. And, and that's really uh, now uh, a, a good thing. Um, we also need more infrastructure for research. 
Uh, and that is also happening. We see now that the research council in Norway are, you know, contributing with grants more and more to this industry. We need important, we need training areas for, uh, you know, for students and operators where they can actually train. And, and, and this is also happening. And as has been said by speakers also previously today, we need more collaboration in Scandinavia. When we have talked to uh, the Norwegian battery companies, they all want to see strength and collaboration between the Scandinavian countries in skills development. And it could also contribute to making Scandinavia a more attractive work region for you know, international battery experts. And, and uh, the, the Axel from Freyr, or someone at least earlier, they mentioned this Nordic uh, belt, battery belt. And I think that's really an exciting uh, proposal because I think that you know, we all have something to, 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 to contribute with. And, and uh, I mean, as, as we say here, get the best from the best. I mean, here in Finland, you have a lot of knowledge about mining, uh, minerals. Sweden, of course, have their you know, car production. In Norway, we also have quite a few industries. We also have our oil industry. So, I mean, we put all this knowledge, all these skills together. There's a lot uh, to be taken from that. And we should involve, you know, all the uh, higher education uh, schools uh, from vocational schools to universities. We've also defined something called the, the battery time squeeze. I see your five minutes. Uh, many players in Europe are competing to close the demand for uh, the, the, the demand gap for battery cell production, and the time window is short. So there's a lot of competition. Come to us, come to Sheleftio, come to Moirana, come to Vasa. Everyone wants them. Uh, so at the moment, there's a lot of people, you know, coming in from, from basically mainly from, from Asia, and of course everyone wants them, and now. And there will be also tough competition to develop and qualify more sustainable technologies for higher battery efficiency and competitive production. I mean, everyone, uh, at least that I talk to in this industry, they recognize that going forward things have to become you know, more sustainable, for instance, to look at the situation with the minerals. Uh, so there's a lot of research uh, and development that's going to go into this industry. And I mean, there's a, there's a, this is something, of course, that, that we want to do in uh, both in, in Norway and, and, and I think also in, in, in most of, of the, the, the European countries in order to have uh, to, to make a difference from what is available in, in batteries today. So I'll go very quickly through this. So practically, I mean, this is a very practical approach that we took. We gathered, first of all, we had the list of requirements from the industry. Then we gathered all the relevant vocational schools and universities in the same room in a hotel in Oslo last autumn. So we asked, the, we presented the list to the educators. This is what the industry requires. What can you deliver? So I'm not going to go into details here. We gave them basically a big Excel uh, sheet uh, where uh, all these different, you know, um, competencies were listed, and we asked, you know, what can you deliver? And you see here everything. I mean, the, the everything that's in in red is. Um, topics where they have no offer, yellow under development, and green courses available. So this is battery education courses. I mean, so you can see basically for the vocational schools there are a lot of gaps because there's a lot of red. Universities, you know, some areas are almost all green, but the challenge is that there are too few people attending these courses, so we need to scale up the number of students that actually take these courses. So th that's the main gap for uh, the universities. And uh, this is something that 
we are now talking to uh, the government about. Uh, we've been uh, a couple of times to uh, the, the education minister to just present, you know, what the requirement is, and she has said, yes, this is something that, of course, we are also very concerned about, so we will try to speed up education. And we see now that uh, this is actually happening. So I just took uh, a few clips from uh, the press here a, a couple of days ago. So one of the vocational schools has now made you know, a large program that you, that you can take from anywhere in, in Norway. They're also working together with Freyr, for instance, and will also be working with some of the other companies. And then uh, the uh, Technological uh, University in Trondheim, NTNU, they have also started up now uh, new courses. So there is a lot of drive now to utilize this uh, chance really for uh, the universities and the vocational schools and also for the secondary schools uh, to actually uh, educate people for this industry. So uh, the next steps for us, I mean we, uh, we delivered our report to uh, the uh, industry minister uh, in January and uh, what we will be uh, doing now, we, we are of course following up on the findings from the, the phase one and the phase two of the project. And then we will be starting on phase three, which is recruitment and society, which of course is a lot uh, to do with uh, what they've also been doing in Sheleftio. Uh, so uh, we, there's still a lot of work to be done uh, in, in this area. So I think that was me almost on time. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And uh, uh, we will continue uh, the presentations uh, uh, with uh, Mr. Juho Heiska. And I think I have seen you on the stage already today. But anyway, uh, Juho will uh, give us uh, the Finnish perspective, uh, training professions with local cooperations. Juho Heiska was the University of Applied Sciences. Please. And thank you, Lasse, for the introduction. Some of you may have seen me already on the uh, on here, standing here. But now I'll be talking more. I try to be quiet because you have to listen to me now <laughs> for 15 minutes. So I want to talk today about uh, the stuff that we have been trying to establish here in Vasa together with all of the educational institutions here located in the Vasa and also slightly uh, looking around the coastal area also. So, as Lasse said, I work as a, in BAMC uh, as a principal energy techno technology lecturer. But I first would like to start with some myth busting. I often hear that uh, the batteries cannot compete in large energy storage systems. And, okay, there's a grain of truth in that. Uh, and they shouldn't always. But they often cite a picture like this, and this is uh, from an academic publication from 2017, where these lithium batteries are taking a quite nice piece of the uh, piece of the whole whole map, but technolo technologies develop. Uh, okay, I'm not being completely fair, fair here because all, all all other technologies also develop all the time, but lithium-ion batteries are being uh, deployed in the wider and wider and a larger and larger energy storage systems all around the world. So I would say that the myth is busted. There's just a few examples of uh, real energy storage systems going around the world. So it's many, many systems already in the 100 megawatt, four hour systems, and even bigger ones. So I think the lithium ion batteries are really taking it by storm. And why is that? So the clear, uh, what everybody knows, what we need batteries for, is the e-mobility. And that's the first driver for batteries, for sure. Uh, you cannot say anything about it. You cannot, uh, you need something to propel your device forward. Um, so, and that will be batteries. But also, I think the, uh, the grid size will be growing all the time. And I think this is, will be mainly for the diversity of the lithium batteries. It's not often realized, 
like how good technology lithium-ion batteries are, because it's actually quite rare for an energy storage device to have, at the same time, have decent specific energy and specific power. And that usually comes, it comes with the price with lithium-ion batteries, yes, but it comes with the advantage that you can use these lithium-ion batteries in multiple different applications and uh, stack business models at the same time. I think we have already established the, this picture already many times. Uh, this is the estimation of how many more gigawatt hour uh, batteries we are going to need in the future. We are still here. This, this panda has a lot of climbing to do. And of course, this is going to generate a lot of new jobs for the people. So where do we get all these professionals? I think that uh, it's the there, there's lots of estimations going around, but it, it's around 90 to 180 jobs per gigawatt hour uh, in cell produ production, how many jobs it will develop. But I think the, the more interesting part is actually also the second, second one, the indirect jobs, the jobs which come from around the value chain. And that, well, that figure also fluctuates a lot, but it's uh, somewhere in the 350 to 1,400. And this is, this is why, this is the, uh, actually, the, there's actually a new picture of this which was published yesterday when I saw it. There's more companies joining it. So this is the Finnish battery uh, value chain at the, well, from the National Battery Strategy of Finland. So it's a one-year uh, publication already, so there's already more companies joining. And this is why there are so many, uh, we are often talking, and people are talking, how much of this cells and batteries part, how, much, how, how many jobs will the cell manufacturing uh, will create. But that's only very, very small part of the whole ecosystem. And of course, here in Vasa, uh, we are very strong on the application sides uh, of the battery value chain. And I think we should keep that in mind going forward, that, this, this, that is our like, expertise also. So the battery science uh, value chain is long and complex. But why Vasa? Looking, looking from the geographical position uh, and looking from, from the Finland, we are a bit on the side, but we are in the middle of this coast area. The coast area which is, which is known to work together in quite big pro projects. Uh, and there's lots of educational cooperation already going ar uh, around this whole co coastal area, nicely connected by Highway 8 going from Turku to Oulu. But what makes Vasa unique is the connection to the Nordics. To Schellete, did I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, <laughs> and Moirana. To, uh, to Ray. So that really makes like, the geographical position Vasa pretty unique compared to like, any other city in Finland, in my opinion. You can argue with me with that. And also, we have so many education institutions in Vasa. We are filled with education institutions. But I think the most fascinating thing, I came from Helsinki, I, I did my studies in Helsinki, and we have the, had a chemistry group, and uh, we had also a chemi another chemistry group in Helsinki University, and we were doing basically the same thing, and we had zero communication between us. Zero. And I think that was sad. We could have learned so much from each other doing our, our, our daily stuff and uh, help solve our problems. But the situation here in Vasa, it's really, really, really different. So all the schools, they are really actively discussing with, with each other and uh, giving ideas, uh, helping each other. Like, should you take this, uh, like, can you teach this to the other people? They, it's really nice to see. And we are not new to this. We were really early. Uh, in 2018, before I started in Vasa, there was already a, already a project, Citra funded project, where there was uh, developed six, six uh, sorry, seven uh, battery-related courses, which actually uh, six of them are still taught in our uh, in curriculums uh, still. The two upper ones, the circular economy and the battery drives, they are still uh, taught uh, in our curriculums in Vasa University of Applied, uh, Applied Sciences. And then the battery chemistry and components of lithium-ion cells, it's taught in Oulu. Uh, also, the recycling and ecosystem is taught in Oulu, and the business models and energy storage smart grids. Those two courses are still taught in the University of Vasa. So we actually were really early. We were doing already stuff when actually, actually Gigavasa started to do something. So the education institutions were really actively looking at what what we can do. And I would actually at this point I would like to thank you all the pro all, all of projects and so on because it's really nice that someone does the. Uh, 
research on the, on the industry, what does the industry need, because then we can mirror those results to our education and see what is actually taught in our schools at the moment and what is not. This is from the, sorry, not from Albert, because I knew <laughs> that you were talking, uh, from AIT Raw Materials. They, had, they have also this report where they look at future expert needs in the battery sector. sector. They have three different categories, and the first one is the battery materials industry. Why I find this funny? Because the first one is academic battery materials expert, and that's basically me, and we are not needed that much. <laughs> but what is actually needed is, uh, so the grade goes like low, which means don't educate less, but maybe not that much more. Uh, two is more, uh, three is much more. So what instantly rises to me is the mobility of people, establishment of digital mindset, mindset system view, and also the process engineers and the recycling from the like, uh, active and passive materials and component side. And this will be a, this is the same trend. If we look on the battery equipment and production in the industry, we are going to also there we are going to need more and more technical staff, project, project managers, mobility of people, establishing a digital mindset and a system view of the whole battery value chain, and also experts on the large scale production. There, there was also this uh, third section where it was looked from the OEM perspective. And, uh, well, we have less part to do this as an academic institution, but here's basically system engineers and application engineers, which is something that we can uh, help with also. So to put these three slides together, uh, this is the, was my analysis of the measures from their analysis of the measures and how we are answering to those questions. So the first measure, are the cross-casting skills uh, through the industry. System-level perspective to, to the batteries, to the battery value chains, and di digital skills. Those are very, very important. Uh, what we are doing, we are offering education in business, IT, battery value chain operation, and basic of batteries. Uh, then, identifying the concrete needs of the battery. And what we are now trying to act, uh, do with this is that we are actively talking with the industry players here in Vasa and hopefully in the Nordics, what is actually needed. Like, come and uh, check our modular. Is it, is it what you want to us teach? Then, roll out interdisciplinary educational programs. And this is how already started. We already have in WAMC and also in other schools in Vasa uh, battery education modules. And also what I think is important is the mixing of academic and vocational training. I need some, sometimes academics need to come uh, out of their chambers and see how it's done in practice to really learn. And then there's the foster the attractiveness of future battery economy. It's about building and marketing an attractive ecosystem, which was already highlighted in, in the Norway and Selefte. And then there's the uh, five points, provide and access to infrastructure, which I will be talking later. So what are our current curriculums for engineers at the moment? We have electrical automation engineer, mechanical information technology, energy te technology, and environment technology. And I went out uh, and checked like real job descriptions online. This was mostly on the Tesla side that they were used to find. But with a little bit of training, there's already a very uh, clear job descriptions in the battery industry for already for our uh, engineers. Of course, with a little bit of battery extra training. And this goes on the systematic view uh, of the whole battery value chain. We have also three new Masters of Engineering programs starting. Uh, we have the Industrial Robotics. Uh, it's in cooperation with ABB. We have our Energy Storage. Uh, Master of Engineering starting, starting in January 2023, and then we have a carbon neutral society starting in fall 2022. And I think all of these will uh, play a key role in this battery education as a whole. We also have incoming battery education, uh, which is packed into two models, uh, which is basic of battery technologies and then the application of battery technology. Uh, this was actually me and my colleague came up with, so let's see how the courses they will be starting to teach next uh, fall. And there's actually one course already going on, which is also my course, it's the lithium-ion battery active materials. So, 
Now I've been talking what's stored in Vasa. Uh, and I want to show what is actually the action that we have been taking. So in Vasa, we have assembled. We have assembled the strike team, uh, which, with, where we all the universities, uh, education institutes, vocational institutes come to, together and discuss. The goal here is to clear, create for Vasa and for all of Finland to create one single platform where all the education is brought in and it will be showcased for everyone so everyone could join. It, it's very interdisciplinary. You can go in, check the courses which you are interested in and get some battery training. And also the mixing of vocational and academic training, uh, training is here is important. Also, this can be used for train the trainers, for the educators. We, we need, really need more of them to study, the, uh, to teach the teachers how to train the subject in batteries. This is operated partly under the CleanOpet project. But what is the big plan? And this is now the first official announcement of this. We are going to get, we are going to try to get a cell manufacturing pilot line here in Vasa. I, I understand this is a very ambitious and big project. Uh, the main focus for this would be R&D, teacher teacher, and teaching purposes. It will be complemented with uh, uh, VR environment and we, the, we will design it so that it's a very fitting for industry 4.0, 5.0 thinking. So it will, will be used for also many thinking, um, many other subjects. Why I think, uh, you might think that we are crazy. No, we are not. There's already other uh, similar projects around the uh, world with, you can check more about it. There's a Liplanet EU where you can find more info. But what I think it would really do the VASA is it would increase the value of the whole ecosystem. It would really mean that Vasa is now an attractive place to come and be because we have this so cool place where you can actually go do hands-on stuff and learn about this battery manufacturing. And then there's my, my last slide, so I'm almost on time. So it's very important to build a brand for this ecosystem that we are building here in Vasa. We have already a very attractive uh, Vasa Energy Cluster and Energy Academy, which this whole thing could work under. But the main message what I want to, uh, with my presentation here and end it with the last, this last sentence, sentence. Vasa is ready and willing to do its fair share in ed of education in the battery value chain with unmatched local cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Juho. And now I would like to invite all the speakers once more on stage for a short panel discussion. Please. And dear audience, uh, if you have any questions or comment, uh, now it's time. If you, if you have any. Maybe that means that uh, I may start. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> okay. Uh, first uh, thing about this, everything is happening so fast right now. And uh, thinking about short term, I think that there's a, uh, a big dependency on, on, on foreign battery experts. How do you feel? Uh, what are the challenges uh, with rec recruiting from outside Europe? I think there's, first of all, there's definitely some language barrier, uh, but it will come, it will probably uh, ease it out uh, after, after a time. But I think it first is just to get people here. And I think it will actually start from the, uh, all the exchange programs where you bring a young talent here and then uh, we just need to have bring, build an ecosystem which is so attractive that they don't want to leave uh, back to their country and they want to stay here and start a family and uh, live, live, live here happily. <laughs> sure, yeah. Sure. Well, well, I'm not from here. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is one thing that we are also uh, handling in the Albats project. We think that, uh, I agree with, uh, with you, with, uh, this is uh, the language barrier can be one of the first things to, to handle. But not only, the, that's the cultural thing as well, because uh, we are 
uh, completely different countries, even in Europe, if only inside of Europe we are uh, in South completely different from, from you here in the North. But if we think about people coming from different continents like mm -hmm. Asia, where the, perhaps the, the skills are at the moment, or the yeah. most skilled people are at the moment, uh, this is a, a quite good challenge and uh, the education system has to deal with this uh, very flexibly because it needs to be fast uh, um, but also very efficiently so uh, otherwise it won't be uh, good enough I would say for the industry. Absolutely. Yeah. What about Norway? Yeah I think that uh, I mean it's basically the same in Norway and, and from my understanding uh, these specialists from, from Asia for instance they can uh, you know they can choose anywhere they I mean they can go anywhere I mean they're so attractive at the moment so and, and of course it's it's quite a hassle to to just have people there for a short time you want to have them there to you know to to establish themselves there often they have families so so uh, and and uh, let's face it I mean many of these factories are being built in places that are quite remote from where some of these people come from so there has to be a motivation in itself to actually go to live in Moiran or in Vasa or in Shredefteo. I mean, mm. obviously Shredefteo is a fantastic place, but uh, when you look at it from somewhere in Asia, you know, it uh, <laughs> may, may, not, uh, may not seem that uh, fantastic. So, so it's, uh, yeah. True. So, uh, uh, Peter, how do you see the situation? Uh, and, uh, do you need uh, the experts? In well, yeah, both. Um, I mean, they, they, Northwood has their development center in Westeros, so uh, they've been attracting a lot of people there. But I agree with, uh, with him that, uh, about the, the competition of, of, uh, of skills. But we've also seen some issues with work permits in Sweden, for example. We have a kind of strict bureaucracy in the north part of the world. So that's been uh, delaying a lot of people to come here to actually work. So that, that's been an issue because we're in the middle of everything. We need people now. So <clears throat> and they sometimes need to wait for six months for some permits. Exactly. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Good. Uh, any, any questions from, from the audience? Not yet? OK. Uh, Today you have thought uh, what's happening in uh, Sweden, in uh, the Alabas project, which, could, uh, which is a European project, and uh, what's happening in, in, in Norway. But uh, what should we do together, we here, in Nordic countries? Juho, how do you feel? Well, I can start and well, I was uh, thinking that I need to talk with you <laughs> after this because we have already started and uh, we have this border project which has, it has left its ap uh, application already about an uh, education cooperation between Vasa, Oulu University, Uppsala University and NTNU mm. in Norway mm. to create a Nordic battery education belt <laughs> network. So if it gets get funded, I hope that uh, you will hear a lot more of, about it in, in the future. So, and that basically would be have the same uh, platform idea that we will have all the courses and that you could take courses from Vasa or NTNU and mix and match uh, something that suits for you need and what you think that you need for the battery industry. Mm. I, I, I wanted to ask uh, to add something because uh, I didn't have time to present <laughs> everything. But I think Just one, one, one uh, way of cooperating uh, that can be very interesting is uh, joint educational programs, not only at national levels but also uh, international. Yes. Because uh, the different countries have different uh, competencies, and uh, so we can try to, to bring the different competencies from different, from different countries. And uh, well, the English is starting to become, it's not starting, it is already, mm -hmm. uh, at least for higher ed education, I believe uh, it's easier to do. Uh, English is a, a common language for all. I believe in VET, if, if we are going for VET education and training, it might be a little bit difficult uh, or more difficult because of the language barriers. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, joint educational programs could be a good, <coughs> good uh, thing to do. Uh, and I believe you, uh, perhaps you already have some experiences also here. I know that in Portugal we have uh, been working with some universities uh, outside of Portugal as well. So this can be a, a good cooperation thing, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Peter, will you add something? Yeah, yeah. So we were like in the middle of everything. So, <clears throat> uh, yeah. As I, yeah, I, I agree with them. Uh, we need to work together in order to get people, and we need mm -hmm. people. I, I would say that that's what we need. We need to get attract more people to the north part of of, of, of this world. We don't have enough people to. Yeah, we, we you talked earlier about the blue colors mm -hmm. and the white colors, and everything. And sometimes we forget our our own ecosystem of companies because. Uh, the competition of talent is so strong. We don't only need to educate people for the battery industry, we need to educate people for the regular companies also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They will exactly. suffer the same uh, illness of not having people to, to work with their business. Yeah, definitely. Um, That's true. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to hear about this uh, <laughs> uh, initiative, uh, academic initiative, but also, as you mentioned in your talk, I mean, to get the vocational schools to work together with universities, I think that's key here. And what we are seeing now, in, for instance, in Norway, is that there is a tendency that people who have a, a bachelor or a master's degree, they actually go to vocational school because they want to get, you know, they get, want to get this practical knowledge. And I think that's extremely important. And as we heard earlier today, um, Freyr, uh, they have a, a technology that is, is fairly advanced. So that means that at least 50% working in their factory is going to be you know, a, a type of candidate who has a mix between a vocational training and a bachelor or a master's degree. Uh, so it will not be you know, just your traditional operator. So I think that to get this, I mean, also that collaboration going is important. And, and obviously we have a lot uh, of, of uh, yeah, good education in the Nordics already. So I, I think we can do this. Good, very good. Uh, still no questions? I think we have still time for, for one question. and. Uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with you guys, but uh, what about the battery industry and gender equality? How to get women to work for the battery industry? <laughs> <laughs> now now they, are, they, they are awake. How do you talk about that? Well, uh, if I can just start, I mean, from all the, the interviews that we have done with uh, and the, and the cell manufacturers, they say that, I mean, these are jobs that are, I mean, just as perfect for, uh, for women as for men, because there are not a lot of heavy lifting. I mean, so, so, I, mean, mm -hmm. so, so, so I think that that's it's obvious. I mean, it should be uh, a, a place where you can have gender equality. Very good. I think that's that's not an issue for the battery sector. It's an issue for the industry uh, as a whole. So, perhaps there we could uh, also work together with other uh, industries uh, and try to bring. If we look at the audience here, okay, we have around no oh, 10 percent or something like that. <laughs> sure. But to, we should really be more attractive uh, in some way. In some way, from school, from already in school, mm. uh, and then for of course for the industry itself. But I think the work should start in the, in the education system. Yeah. Yeah, but can I just add that uh, there's one thing that the industry needs to do, and that is to, to come out and, and say to young people that come to us, we need you. We are an attractive industry. Uh, you can have you know, uh, uh, work, uh, a lifelong career in this industry. Because they, 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 they have a lot of competition. I mean, it's not obvious that young people want to go to the battery industry. There are lots of other industries that, that are also going to, to require a lot of uh, you know, talented people going forward. So, so the industry needs to be, at least in my mind, more offensive with regards to getting the best talent. Yes. I actually want to, uh, want to, want to see data. Is the, like if you would look at the battery value chain as a whole, what would be the gender balance in that? Because I think that there definitely probably is some areas in the battery value chain where there are more females than uh, males. Because if I look at uh, my 
um, two courses in environment te technology and the energy technology. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have a lack of uh, females in, in the environment technology courses, which is very important for the, I think it's just all about marketing. How can we market this battery industry that there's a, it plays so key role in the uh, decarbonization of all the industry? And I think that will would also bring uh, the females in. Yeah. Yeah. I think the branding part is uh, important also. If you see, I mean, look at Northvolt, I, I think they've done a, a fabulous job of attracting women into their business. Uh, I was quite surprised when I, when I heard some numbers, uh, also how the balance is, <clears throat> because we were afraid that another industry will bring more men into Schlefto. But uh, what we can see is there's a lot of women are want to work with Northvolt because of their brand. I mean, they have a quite mm -hmm. strong brand, and it's quite modern, and it's, uh, I, I look at what, they are quite attractive for people in general. A lot of women go there also to, to, to look for a job. And I, as I said, I don't think the battery industry in itself, I mean, the battery production will have an issue with that in the future. It's more like looking at other businesses within yep. the, the battery industry. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, now I think uh, we will have the, the lady with the numbers and she has something for you, for you Anna. And, uh, <laughs> Let's uh, give a big hand for, for our speakers today, and thank you very much. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. You don't get another one. Ah. <laughs> I already have one. <laughs> I'm lucky. Now I think uh, Christopher looks like he has something to say. Please, Christopher. Will you have the mic is coming over there? Shall we go? Shall we... Oh, before go. <laughs> I'll be really short, just a minute so so you can stay. So, oh, <laughs> oh really? I'll, I'll be I'll be quick. So so uh, my name is uh, Christopher Janssen. I'm the brand manager for Energy Vasa, and I'm also the main organizer for Energy Week. Uh, about, or actually over 1,000 days ago, Lasse asked me to close Energy Week 2019. It's been three years since the last time. We had two years of you-know-what. But if we go back even further, 2017, what we had then outside Energy Week was two electric cars. And yesterday, when we were at dinner, there were three of them blocking the best parking spots. <laughs> so this is five years what happens. And in three years, you can see what happens. So a lot of things changes in five years. We can see that in uh, five years ago in Shilefto, we probably had nice woods. Now we have fantastic, beautiful things. So the world is changing at a more rapid pace than ever before. But uh, with regards to, to some closing words, I would like to, to thank everybody at Energy Week who has organized the 25 seminars we have here. They were made up by over 150 speakers, about 50 people actively making these programs, and by 30 organizations. And of course, the sponsors who have been hopefully visible the whole time. But one thing I would really like to thank is all of you who have taken the time to come here to spend the time to uh, visit the exhibit, to have your businesses here, to come here to network. Without you, Energy Week would just be good, but now it's excellent. And usually, the, the common thing is to probably summarize an event, the closing words, what have we learned today, interesting thoughts. I will not do that. I will leave that up to you, and next year, you come here and tell me what did you learn? What have you taken with you? And where are we in 2023? Thank you.